a prayer together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this wonderful season, as we all expect and wait for the Holy Spirit, Pentecost tomorrow, we call on that same Holy Spirit to fill us with the joys, the gifts, the fruits that will support and help us and help us in enabling us to listen, to learn and to take forward. And we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Amen. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have two fantastic speakers for you today. And the first of our speakers is Nicole Rochelle Moore. She's a college associate and curator for the British Library's Caribbean Collections. She has curated and taught courses on the writers Andrea Levy and Tony Morrison. And she's also closely involved with the New Beacon, uh, New Beacon Books place. Nicole is a fan of Caribbean food and obviously of literature, and you'll hear that when she speaks. She will give an interview of immigrants coming to the United Kingdom between the years 1945 and 1985. She'll tell us a little bit about who they were, why they came here and where they settled. So without ado, I hand over to Nicole, please. Thanks so much, Yogi. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, Gloria is my very trusted technical expert this morning with the slides. Thanks, Gloria. So as Yogi said, um, this webinar, part of Kaj's Changing Face of Britain, is looking at a brief history, if you like, a, an overview, as Yogi said, of um, those uh, peoples, I like to think, peoples who came, who they were, why did they come, and where did they settle? Thanks, Gloria. Can we move to the next slide, please? So I'm, I'm uh, really not wanting to bamboozle at all with too much science and statistics and, and figures like that. I, I wanted it to be as as uh, accessible as, as possible. So I'm asking what is understood by the word immigrant? There are many definitions. Um, and according to an August 2018 publication of the House of Commons Library, several definitions for a migrant exist in the United Kingdom. A migrant can be one, someone whose country of birth is different to their country of residence. Two, someone whose nationality is different from their country of residence. And three, someone who changes their country of usual residence for a period of at least a year so that the country of destination effectively becomes the country of usual residence. And that is the one, and the third definition is the one that I, I will be using. So for the purposes of this presentation, the last one. And uh, they just uh, obviously some, some images of uh, some of the people who came from different places. Next slide, please, Gloria. And actually while Gloria is pulling up the next slide, I found in my um, treasure trove of books at home, a little pamphlet, I don't know if anybody can see it, Black in a White World, this is a 1968, Pamphlet, pamphlet coming out of The Economist, and it was written by Elizabeth Burney. And I'll just read a little bit about what she says about the word immigrant. She says, the word immigrant has become the British euphemism for someone whose skin is darker than white. The term remains accurate for about 80% of the non-white population. So this is written in 1968, Elizabeth Burney. So who were these immigrants who, who came in the period after um, World War II? Often when we speak or think about um, post-war migration to Britain, the image that readily comes to mind is um, that of Caribbean 
and and by Caribbean, usually people, when you say Caribbean, they automatically think of, of African Caribbean peoples. And I often have to remind people, actually, we have Asians in the Caribbean, um, and in and in the Caribbean, we tend to say Indian, Indian, because they came, they really did come from India. That's it is from India that um, Caribbean Indian people kind of came. Uh, Chinese, Portuguese, you know, you have a whole host of Caribbean people, so it isn't just made up the Caribbean of African Caribbean peoples. But the myriad images of the June 1948 passengers disembarking the ship. Empire Windrush, and then I'm asking, but we don't go into that today. How much do we know about this, the role of Empire Windrush before it was renamed that as a carrier during the war? I'm sorry, if you can hear barking in the background, I can't do anything about that, Jack Russell. I'm so sorry. Um, yes, so, um, so those are the ones that come, that form an understanding of this time in Britain's history. And while not inaccurate, that the, the kind of what we kind of readily think of, while it's not inaccurate, it's only partial. So I'd like us to think about the danger of the single story, as the writer Chimamanda Adichie has famously said. And I want us to kind of broaden our understanding and <laughs> sidestep the danger of the single story trap. By 1945, at least 10,000 <clears> 10, Jewish people were living in Britain. And after the end of the Second World War, the British Nationality Act of 1948 permitted 800,000 subjects. Oh gosh, I think I put an extra three zeros there. 800,000 subjects of the British Empire to live and work in the United Kingdom without needing a visa. So where were these people coming from? People from Bangladesh, from Ghana, from Hong Kong, from India, from Ireland, Kenya, Nigeria, Pakistan, and South Africa were among those making their way to these shores. And additionally, post-war labor recruitment schemes saw Germans, Italians, Ukrainians, Austrians, and Poles setting, settling in the UK. Um, and then in later years, from the 1950s to early 1960s, there were people coming in from Hungary and Pakistan, and they too would join the mix of immigrants living here. In 1972, that was the year that um, Idi Amin in Uganda gave uh, Ugandan Asians three months to get out of the country. And so in that year, roughly 30,000, I think it was, they say the number is specifically 27,000. Um, they added another layer to the rich history, I say, of the British populace. And in the 1980s, we found Somalians moving to the UK. Um, and then I asked a question, and that's for a, a later a later debate some other time. What do we know? How much do we know about Somalian um, settling, Somalian settling here since the 19th century in this country? So they have a long history here. Um, and certainly by 1985, the UK was home to thousands of Britons from a multitude of different heritages. So that's a kind of a whistle stop um, overview of who they were. Gloria, may I have the next slide, please? I don't know how to stop the dog from barking. Sorry. Close the door and see if it makes a difference. Okay, so these, these are just some images I thought. Um, and I can briefly, if I remember now, because I didn't put captions. The first one on the top left is um, of a young Irish woman. She looks like a girl, but it's a young Irish woman um, arriving in London to start a new life here. The one along from that is of some Muslims um, at prayer um, in a mosque in Cardiff. Uh, the one on the right top row is of the proprietor and the doorman at um, an Indian restaurant in London. All of these photos are coming out of the 1950s, by the way. Um, and then bottom left, young Pakistani man working hard in, um, in Lancashire, in one of the factories in Lancashire. Um, and then a Greek Cypriot family in Labrick 
Grove, I remember. That, oh, in Bayswater, I think I remember. And this is also, this is 1956. And then the last photo, which I really like, of children, different, we use the term, of course, it's the only one we have, of different races, different hues, all in uh, Butte Town, in Tiger Bay in in Wales. So just some images from uh, from the period. Thank you, Gloria. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, I kind of chanced upon these uh, images when while doing this research. So why did they come? Uh, migration from the late 1940s happened for different reasons. That Jewish migrants were primarily settling here as a consequence of Nazi persecution. Um, and, but apart from that, there was also um, in the post-war years, really active encouragement from this country given to colonial subjects to move here in order to fill gaps in the UK labor market for both skilled and unskilled roles. Um, we had the, 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 we saw the, the newly created National Health Service and you had London Transport and these were two of the major employers actively recruiting workers from the empire. They would go out to, to different countries and, and um, encourage people to move here to fill those gaps, those labor gaps, as we say. So those immigrants or, or those migrants, those words are sort of interchangeable, um, would have been coming for economic reasons. So <clears throat> economic migrants took up offers of what many saw as a chance of a better life with more opportunities here in Britain. Um, and many Caribbeans, um, including several that I've spoken with over the years about this, would say to me that they had like a five-year plan. They had a five-year plan, um, which would culminate with, with them returning to their countries of origin. But very often, this plan did not materialize. Um, many uh, African uh, immigrants moved to the UK for economic reasons as well, but many, many African uh, migrants came here for education. And actually, statistically, and I don't have the figures, it would seem that um, those who came from the continent of Africa, a lot of them tended to would go back after doing, you know, the studying and the, the kind of qualifying and so on. But of course, many have stayed. Um, and others still made the crossing here to escape political hardship and danger. So examples of that would be, obviously, I just I mentioned before, Ugandan Asians having to leave um, uh, while Idi Amin was uh, head of the country um, in 1956. Uh, a lot of Hungarians came to Britain because of political unrest in their country. Um, and so it went on. I mean, you had the partition that then, so then we had India and Pakistan. And so there, you know, there was a lot of hardship. There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of loss for people. And so, you know, you found many Pakistanis coming. Certainly um, when India became independent in, 1947, um, Indians started coming to Britain, and by before 1955, there were at least 60,000 Indians who had come here. So people were coming for, for different reasons. And so the images I um, chose to use here are two from the NHS, um, historical images from the NHS with some nurses and also um, for London Transport, uh, one of the recruitment posters, and then an image of a woman learning to, to be, well, she's becoming, she's in her training to become a bus driver, and that was somewhere in Chiswick, and that was in the 1970s somewhere. Thank you, Gloria. Next slide, please. Oh, 
I can give actually while Gloria is pulling up the next slide, I can give some more figures. So Asians came in 1992. By 1951, there were 162, 339,000 Polish people who came here. Um, uh, Pakistanis came by 1951, there were at least 10,000 here. And all in all, the Commonwealth population, because remember that, that the Commonwealth, I mean, when we when people talk about post-war and they think only of the Caribbean, there's so many other countries, of course, that make up the Commonwealth. Um, and so the Commonwealth population continued to grow here in, in Britain. So 1953, you had about 3,000. Um, by 1956, you had 46,800 people from the Commonwealth. And by 1961, you 126, 400,000 um, Commonwealth citizens coming. Um, in the 1970s, uh, you had about 72,000 people coming in per year, again, from Commonwealth nations. But that would then fall in, in the 1980s and then rise. They've been, you know, the trend has been rise and fall, rise and fall. So in the final section here, I am asking and, and sharing with you where um, different groups settled. And I know that I have in, in this short presentation would have, have kind of left out information about many you know other groups. I didn't really give numbers, for instance, but I can. I've pulled them up already on my phone for um, numbers for Chinese um, immigrants numbers for Greek Cypriot immigrants and and Greek Cypriots or Cypriots would also be those who came certainly by 1955 when um, the troubles in Cyprus the war between um, the Greeks and the Cypriots started so uh, um, they started coming in certainly in the 1950s at least like 25,000 I remember that figure so historically, Africans from different countries on the continent have settled throughout the UK. There is, um, in Southeast London, we can attest a concentration of West Africans there, and they form communities, you know, in um, Greater London. Bangladeshis have strong communities in East London, but they have settled in other parts of this country as well. But East London, most notably the borough of Tower Hamlets, has um, historically, we have seen um, communities from Bangladesh, with Bangladesh heritage there. Caribbean communities have tended to settle in Birmingham, Greater London, Greater Manchester, and West Yorkshire, with Birmingham having the largest population, followed by Croydon and Lewisham in London. I sometimes struggle to accept Croydon as London, but people say it's London, so I'll, I'll, I'll go with it. Caribbean, uh, yes, uh, Croydon, Croydon and Lucian. And so they are established as well among Chinese, for the, with Chinese communities, there are established uh, in London, we have Chinatown, but there are other Chinatowns in major cities such as Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester and New Newcastle upon Tyne. Um, and the Chinese communities are found in major towns such as Edinburgh, Belfast, Cardiff, Bristol, Sheffield, Cambridge and Milton Keynes. German immigrants, um, because they were, and I don't remember if I said that actually, post-war there were Germans and Italians and Austrians and Polish um, people who were recruited to work here as well. Um, German immigrants were kind of settled in London, but also in Manchester, and Indians tended to settle in Birmingham, Leicester, London, and Wolverhampton. Um, Irish immigrants historically could be found in London, Bristol, Canterbury and Newcastle and also in York. And Italians uh, would set up in Clerkenwell in London, um, in Ancoats, in Manchester, uh, in Sheffield um, and Grass Market in Edinburgh. And also later on, uh, Italian sort of community, an Italian community or sort of like Italian neighborhoods um, were formed in London, in Soho. 
Historically, Jewish communities uh, tended to be found in London's East End and then latterly in Northwest London. And because of, um, and with Pakistanis coming, traditionally they were coming and they were filling those, um, as we talked about, so the gaps in the labor market, working in factories, in sort of the woolen factories, as they would say. And so they settled in Lancashire, West Midlands and Yorkshire. And Polish people have set up all over the UK. I want to say as well that though I'm dealing with the period, or I've been dealing with the period 1945 to 1985, many, many of these, um, if you want, immigrant groups, as they would have been seen, would have had longer histories of coming here. But we're looking at um, obviously 1945 to 1985. So Polish people have set up all over, had their communities settled all over the UK. Uh, Ukrainians, um, historically built their community in Manchester after World War II. Um, so, you know, uh, the danger of the of the single story, I hope, has been sidestepped because there are many, many stories contained within the story of post-war migration to the UK. So that is my short, my succinct um, presentation. I think my next slide is just a thank you. So... We can open it up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for a very, very interesting uh, presentation there, uh, Nicole. Thank you. Now I'm going to open up to everybody for a discussion. Um, questions to Nicole and also any comments that you wish to add to what Nicole has said would be very welcome. Now, um, it's going to be difficult to see. So if you can put a little hand in your right-hand corner of your, your picture, then um, Gloria will be able to see that and tell us uh, who's next. Also, please use the chat if you wish to uh, write up a chat, anything into the chat that will also be appreciated. Uh, just a reminder to everyone that this is being recorded. Questions to Nicole, please. Well, I've just seen a um, I've just seen a, a comment in the Nana. Yeah, Nana says words are powerful in his book Settlers. The author Jimmy Fumorewa uses the word settlers, saying that the notion of settling. Actually, I look, I picked the book up yesterday at New Beacon Books, and and I'm saying to myself that I'm going to buy it. Denotes a sense of steadfast. Um, of compromise and of claiming something as your own. It has a quiet defiance and reversal of colonial occupation. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Nana, Nana, do you wish to come back? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Nicole, for your presentation. It was um, really great to hear. And it's, it's so great to see the photos, actually, because it's a documentation of our our history that sometimes you don't often get to see. I was just building on um, yeah. how powerful word how powerful words are really because um, perhaps during during that period that you um, described, you know, economic migrant wasn't seen as a dirty word, and today it is. So when the news media um, uh, um, announce the net migration figures. I, this is me personally, I always go, oh God, because it's so negative <laughs> about um, being a migrant, being an immigrant, being, being um, an economic migrant. And you don't, there's never that delving into Mm. the the core story of why people are here you get the you get the nhs story we haven't got enough nurses so we have to look for them elsewhere but it doesn't dig for so 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 everything is negative mm. and you just kind of feel oh today's the day that i shouldn't really go out because you no. know uh, uh, the the by by simple fact of the color of my skin i'm an economic exactly, that's exactly, how i'm going to be exactly. viewed as soon as i step outside of my uh, said step outside of my house so i found mm. jimmy framaway's book really interesting because it kind of claimed the positivity mm. of that migration story 
and it's yeah. that it's that that we don't hear um a lot of yes thank you for that and of course he kind of links it so uh intimately with food right and he um because food is his thing uh, later today i'll be speaking with three chefs and so they will talk to about that whole <laughs> kind of migration you know in a way but using food um Yes, I agree. I mean, I, I, I certainly have not felt um, with, with you know, like when figures come out and stuff, I, I've not felt that, um, I've not been tentative about stepping out of my door. But um, yes, I mean, I think that there is more, there tends to be more of a negative um, kind of slant. And yet, you know, um, and yet it was, it was all kicking off in Miami, I think maybe this weekend, because immigrants, migrants, however they want to be settlers, however they want to be, however they call them, you know, they're just hands off. We're not working. We're not working. We're like, we're not going out. We're not buying. We're not going to work. We're not shopping. We're not. Let, let Florida see how it gets on without, you know, maybe I'm not. I'm not saying let's do the same, but it would be great actually. <laughs> if that was, I think it would be wonderful. Let them see, you know. I mean, when people have said things like, you know, like go back to your, I mean that I haven't had that recently. When we were younger, my brother lived here. My brother and I were both born here, and then back and forth to Trinidad and Tobago, and then and then back, and then we stayed, and then he's never come back. To, to to the UK but you know like when people would say that we're like yeah bring it on pay me I'll go you know what I mean I think there has to be a kind of way that we deal it like we're here what are you really going to do about it and actually what can you do without it mm -hmm. it being us being here yeah I think there's a way in which I think more and more people are sort of claiming you know an understanding and actually and actually, you know, I find with younger people, especially when they have been exposed to their places of heritage, they are really kind of stronger in themselves because they are here and they are British and they are there. And so when I talk about home, I could be talking about Trinidad and Tobago, but I could be talking about Archway, London. You know what I mean? So, yeah. We've got two more questions, Nicole. Uh, there's one in the chat and then Ursula would like to have the second one. So the one in the chat first. Okay, thank you for your whistles, Opto. Can you say a bit more about Ukrainians? Not so much. Why did they come? Why did they settle? Well, there was, um, there was, I don't know if that, yes, I think that there is still a, um, a Ukrainian presence. I don't know how big it is. I think probably more uh, in recent in these recent months, and of course, since last year, probably more Ukrainians are coming to London. There was, um, hold on, let me just kind of pull it up. There was a war. There's, there's, It's always a kind of, you know, it's always a war of some kind happening somewhere. Um, but with the Ukrainians, there were problems, certainly uh, with the Soviet Union and and so I don't have the full history but I know that there was tension um and possibly out and out violence and Ukrainians started coming in after the second world war um and I think that as I said before we we look at the the post war period but you know there there are you know, Ukrainians, Austrians, and so on, they have much longer histories of coming here and perhaps not like like consecutive years, <clears throat> you know, like ongoing, but certainly a presence in this place. And so it kind of like, I smile sometimes when people talk about, you know, about, you know, people talk about keeping it British because it is made up this place of, you know, just like in a way, just like America, it is made up of um, immigrants, if you like, from a long time ago. So the Ukrainians, um, I haven't done as much digging into to that. But yes, they are still in Manchester. Um, and in fact, there is in Manchester, so yeah, you have the... Um, it's something like the Ukrainian, it's like a, a big 
sort of community. I want to use the word community center, but it isn't that. It's almost like a big kind of Ukrainian sort of federation in Manchester. So, yeah. Thanks, Nicole. Ursula? Well, I wanted to say something about the immigrant uh, coming to England, well, coming to the, from the Commonwealth. You know, I live now in Brittany, I live in France, and they're Francophony, and mm. they're immigrant here. So, uh, First of all, I don't get on with one of them. And, um, you know, uh, I just always look back to Wales and to England and to London. You know, how I like, how I like the immigrants, how enriching they are for the society and how beautiful they are and the colors and the smile, you know. And uh, the people here, immigrant, French immigrant, have even not a smile. I don't know what the situation is, um, what the situation is with with the cult, or you know, I don't know. I have, I don't know. I haven't studied that subject. I have no contact with people, but I definitely know the North African people. I get best on the um, Tunisia, the Moroccan, these people. The commerçant, they have very kind shop owners. You can go. You're not insulted. You go in like in England, you know, or in, in Brixton or whatever where you're. You just treat it as a at the human, you know, sort of. And with other French people, have terrible problem with francophone problems with Huyanka, Yupo, whatever they all come from, and Black African. Uh, I, I have just problems. I just run. I run. I take my back and run like like sort of um, a German dog. Heil Hitler, German. Well, there's no end. I was beaten, and I was stoked in pistols. I was beaten down. Um, you know, I don't know what I have, you know, I just, I, I just want to be, I don't go out, uh, definitely I don't shop in a French shop, and as you said, you know what the people do in America, I don't go shopping, I, I get everything online, I let it bring from Germany or from my friends, and I have farming friends, you know, very kind farming friends, they, they look for the solidity with people on their own, but I, I, I haven't, you know, I haven't got the insight of the, mm -hmm. I haven't studied French, really, I don't speak French very, very well. I have a German accent. And I said, who's that about under what the accent, you know? And mm. sort of uh, sort of very, very rude people. And they 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 don't want that I, I like, I just like a color, pe people from your color, you know? There's this beautiful smile. And for me, it's sort of our lady, you know, sort of very nice, sort of rain, sort of rain for it, I wouldn't know. And they want to put me to the white people. And for me, it's very hard to sit with white people. And um, white people, you know, there are white people who are black, maybe, you know. But they are white people, very rude people. And this is my experience from Brittany. And um, you know what to say about the German Arias? I, To be honest, I don't believe that they, they exist everywhere in the world. They're not only in Germany, they're everywhere. And they're in Brittany, they're in Flandern, they're everywhere. In Wallen, they're everywhere. And if you look at the stories, I looked at the Begin movement in Belgium. You know, it's very interesting how they have been treated and what, what fight is there everywhere. This, they're oppressed and this is oppressed and they're oppressed then, you know, sort of thing. And... Uh, I look step by step, but I have no school here who leads me, no no teacher, you know. And the university is the same thing. You're not welcome. You have a diploma from England, BA, you have only BA, you know, a little one. And, you know, TEFL agreement, no, French not recognized, you know. So where are you from? I'm from Africa, <laughs> you know, a German Africa, a German Africa, and a German black. And... Uh, it's very interesting from time to time. So I want to share that with you. Thank you're not you. On your own. Yeah. You're Thanks, not on your own. Thank you. I can't see everybody, but uh, is there another hand up, Gloria? Uh, no, I can't no. see a hand and I don't see any question. I think I think that should be it. Thank you very much, Gloria. Thank you for those um, comments from the people we did. It's, it's always interesting to hear what other people have to say. Uh, we're learning all of the time from one another. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to introduce our second speaker. And most of you would have met Margaret Ann. Uh, Margaret Ann Fiskin is a non-practicing barrister 
and she's a very, very long-standing associate, associate for Kaj. Or I should say she has a long-standing association with Kaj. She was actively involved in migration issues for many years, eight of those as a member of the Caritas Europa Migration Commission. Today, she will pick up where Nicole has left off, and she's going to discuss migration to the UK after 1985. And she's hopefully going to give us um, Thursday's announcement regarding record net migration figures. I hope this is all okay, Margaret Ann. Margaret Ann, you're muted. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks, Thank Margaret Ann. Thank you so much. Um, let me just, yeah. Um, I, yes, I, I like, um, like Nicole, are counting on Gloria. I'm counting on Gloria as our valued tech expert. <laughs> um, are we ready to go? <laughs> okay, so um, I think um, it's going to be, as Nicole said, a whistle-stop tour because a lot has happened over the past 40 years, just as a lot has happened between um, the 45 and 85 that Nicole was discussing. Uh, Gloria, can I have the second slide, please? Uh, yeah. So um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, who came and where they came. So in the 1970s, um, an average of 72,000 immigrants were settling in the UK from the Commonwealth. Um, and this decreased in the, nine, in the early 1980s and the early 1990s as well to around 54,000 people coming in in a year. So that was not a major issue. Um, immigration um, had been... I think the government felt that the immigration issue was under control, but from the late 80s onward, we begin to see the growth of asylum, of requests for asylum. And this sort of changed um, the nature of what, how the government approached immigration. So um, Gloria, slide three, please. Okay. Um, yeah. So Nicole mentioned the Somali, that Somalians had come and Somalians, it's true, had been coming since the 19th century and they were seafaring people and they settled, um, I think around Bristol and Cardiff. And um, so there was a settled Somalian community in the West of England and in Wales, but in, um, in, uh, the 1991, there was a civil war in Somalia. And that was, that began in the 1989 or so, it began to be unsettled. And in 91, um, there was a civil war and a lot of Somalians, and when I say a lot, not a significant number, but enough that it was registered in the government as um, people from outside coming and needing asylum. And they were one of the first non-EU groups that came. And as I say, the numbers were small, they were really not significant and they're still not significant. The number of um, people that stated Somalia as their country of birth in the 2021 census was 108,921. And this equates to less than 2% of the population of England and Wales. And the only reason I mention it is because um, once the asylum issue became a very big issue and a polarizing issue, it was largely to deal with um, European um, requests. But initially it was this, um, this Somalian crisis that fueled a lot of, um, uh, let's say, uh, anger amongst the population. So um, Gloria, please, the fourth one. We all remember the fall of the Berlin Wall, these iconic pictures that were taken. And this is when things really began to shift in the early 90s. The fall of the Berlin Wall in 89, the breakup of the Soviet Union, and the early 1990 conflicts 
in the former Yugoslavia led to increased humanitarian flows to the UK and other European countries. And policymakers who were unused to seeing large numbers of asylum seekers arrive began to legislate to change. And there was, um, I would say, reactive legislation and very harsh legislation. And I think that has been the pattern since the early 1990s. Um, slide five, please. Um, 1992. So there were two expansions of the European community. The first was in 1992. Um, and Gloria, slide six. Um, in 1992, the UK joined other EU nations in signing the Maastricht Treaty on European Integration. This granted all EU citizens equal rights with freedom to live in any member state they chose. So in the following decade, tens of thousands of EU citizens came to live and work in Britain. Now, interestingly, not that there, there wasn't that much of a protest at the time, but I think that was because at this point, um, there were people coming in and there were people going out. So these net migration figures were balanced. A lot of Britain, people from Britain went to live in other parts of the EU. So it wasn't such a big deal. But then, um, slide seven, please, Gloria. Um, in 2004, you had an even bigger EU expansion and things went a bit crazy after that. Um, slide eight. So in 2004, the EU was expanded to include seven nations from the Eastern Bloc, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, and also Slovenia, Malta, and Cyprus. And Germany and France took measures, temporary restrictions to keep, to limit the flow of migrants into the country, into their countries from these new member states. Tony Blair's Labour government had a very positive stance on immigration at that point. And it argued that a growing economy required a larger workforce and compared it to the, the wind rush and people coming over in the late 40s and early 50s and said that people from other countries were considered a good source of new labor, no pun intended. And um, the government predicted wildly wrongly that EU enlargement would only cause a rise of up to 13,000 people a year in immigration. As we remember, more than a million people came from these countries and arrived and stayed over the next decade. And it was one of the biggest influxes in British history. And um, my personal opinion is that um, immigration... Oh. Sorry? Sorry, excuse me. Oh, that that migration has been mishandled and mismanaged. Um, from the early 90s by subsequent governments, you know, whether it was um, the, the Labour or the Tories. And it has been fueled by the, the tabloid media. So we, we have a very polarized position. We have, you know, people don't want to give, and I knew this when I was working in, on this, these issues, that you don't want to give any ground because people, um, uh, see you as um, weakening, and yeah, it's 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 been a very sad situation ever since. So, um, number nine, please Brexit. So, as I say, in the late nineties, the pace and scale of immigration increased to a level without historical precedent, and between two thousand and one and two thousand and eighteen the foreign born population doubled from 4.6 million to more than 9 million. And as arrivals grew, so did public sentiment against immigration. Um, but for the most part, 
the government's reshaping of migration policies has had little impact on the numbers, on the scale of migration, or on the public anxiety regarding migration. So it's, you know, it, it's, we've had dramatic moves, but nothing really has changed, as you'll see from the most recent figures. Um, number 10, please. So how has Brexit changed immigration? Before Brexit, European Union and UK citizens had the freedom to live, work, or study in any EU country without needing a work visa. This came to an end on 1st of January, 2021. In 2022, uh, these are the, some of the figures that have come out. In 2022, net EU migration was minus 51,000. This means that more EU nationals left the UK than arrived. Net migration of non-EU nationals, and again, the difference between those arriving and leaving, was 662,000. Um, I'm going to come back to these figures. I just want to say a, a little bit about COVID. Um, Gloria, 11, please. I just... COVID is a difficult one to assess, the impact of COVID, um, because in 2020, net immigration to Britain fell by almost 90%, and that was to its lowest level since 1993. And it's difficult to know how much of that was a result of COVID and how much of, was a result of Brexit, but it was a combination of the two. And so the, the figures for, 90, for 2020 are somewhat artificial. And um, yes, I'll go on to the next one, please. Uh, number 12, net migration in the UK. I'm sorry, my voice is going. Um, so, um, you're probably all aware that figures published on Thursday show that migration added 606,000 people to the UK's population in 2021. Um, and just to break that down a little bit, um, number 13, please. Oh, how many migrants come to the UK? In 2022, 1,163,000 people came to the UK expecting to stay for at least a year. And that's the definition that Nicole was using. Um, and an estimated 557,000 people departed. That means that net migration, the difference between the number arriving and the number leaving was 606,000. This represents a record high and an increase of 118,000 from 221, 2021. But again, you have to remember that COVID, Brexit skewed those figures a little bit. And people were anticipating um, that the net migration figures would be 700 or 800,000 or possibly more. So I think the government felt it that somehow, um, you know, achieved something by keeping it down to 600,000. Um, slide 14. So who is coming and what's causing these figures? The three main reasons um, for the increase in figures, according to the reports, are one, bespoke humanitarian routes. So the largest single factor um, for, e for visas granted to non-EU citizens from 2019 to 2022 was the introduction of visa routes for Ukrainians and Hong Kong British nationals. Together, these two routes contributed 45% of the 467,000 increase during this period. International students accounted for a further 39% of the increase. And um, I'll say a little bit more about students in a minute. The UK has an explicit strategy of increasing and diversifying foreign student recruitment, um, but that is looks like it's changing because of this leaked memo that has been in the news. And skill workers. 23% of the increase in visa grants from 2019 
to the year ending June 22 resulted from work visas. And that is almost exclusively skilled workers because it's very difficult to get a visa um, if, unless you're a skilled worker these days. Health and care was the main industry driving the growth. And um, the increase was due partly to post-Brexit immigration system, but a higher demand for workers who were already eligible for visas under the old system, such as doctors and nurses. Okay, um, the number 15, I want to say a little bit about students because we really don't know what's happening. Um, the government, I think, is is threatening to that um, students can't bring any dependents and that they won't be able to stay beyond getting their degrees. Now, the government hasn't confirmed all of the, any of this, in fact, but it, it looks like it could be one of their routes to bring the numbers down that they're talking about. So in 2022, the government issued 485,000 student visas. Half of those were granted to Indian and Chinese nationals. Students from Nigeria were the next most common nationality of student visa holders, followed by Pakistan and Bangladesh. Students on postgraduate courses could also apply for visas for qualifying dependents and children yeah, under 18 years old. Again, that's, that is, we'll see whether that continues. Um, in 2022, 135,000 visas were issued to dependents. Um, so on the 23rd of May, um, which was Thursday, was, was that Thursday? Yes. The government announced it was removing the right for international students to bring dependents unless they were on postgraduate courses designated as research programs. Um, students who've already completed their degree can stay in the UK for two years, three for those with a doctoral degree to work under a graduate visa. But again, um, that's being challenged. And you can see there, um, there are differences within the cabinet about how this should go. And Suella Braverman has her ideas and the prime minister has his ideas and we don't know how this is all gonna pan out. Um, I just wanna come back, um, if we could go to slide 16, please. Um, I, I just wanna say a little bit about refugees and asylum seekers, because again, these were, we got up to date figures on these um, on Thursday as well. And the latest home office figures show the backlog had risen to 172,758 at the end of March, despite the government promising to bring it down. And the number of asylum seekers who have been waiting longer than six months for a decision now stands at over 128,000. So there's a lot, um, you know, we hear promises, we hear they're tightening up, we hear this is gonna change and that's gonna change, but the system seems to be broken and how they're gonna mend that system, I think is where there are the big question marks. Is it going to be um, Suella's dream of planes taking off to Rwanda or is it gonna be something a little more humane? I think that all remains to be seen. And just a quick word, um, 17, please, on seasonal workers. Um, mm -hmm. The government has said that 45,000 visas for seasonal workers will be available in 2023, with the potential to increase that number by 10,000, if necessary. Seasonal workers aren't included in the overall figures. And I should have said for the first time in these figures that came out on Thursday, refugees who have achieved refugee status are included. They hadn't been included up to this year. And I have a couple of charts. Um, um, slide 18. Thank you, Gloria. Um, so I don't know if you can see clearly, but essentially um, this is up to 2020, but it hasn't changed dramatically. 
the five largest foreign born populations were from the bottom up, you can see India, um, approximately 847,000, Poland, 746,000, Pakistan, 519,000, Romania, 370,000, and the Republic of Ireland, 364,000. So these are the largest foreign born populations um, in the UK at the moment. And the final slide, <laughs> um, which is the regional distribution of the UK's foreign born population. Now, my brain has difficulty dealing with these um, different charts. So the first one is what share of migrants live in each region. And then the second one is what share of people in each region are migrants. Um, it took me a little while to, to think it through, but they're very similar figures. So essentially, um, a large majority of foreign born UK residents live in England, 90% in 2020, with 6% in Scotland, 2% in Wales, and 1% in Northern Ireland. Um, in, in 2020, almost half were in the regions of London, and that was 36%, or 3.2 million people, or the Southeast, which was 13%, or 1.2 million people. So largely England and largely London and the Southeast um, is where migrants are living. Um, and that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's so much information. I have to apologize for rushing through it, but it could have taken forever. <laughs> Thank you ever so much for that, Margaret. And again, a most interesting talk. And I'm so grateful that we are recording it because I, for one, would certainly go back and listen to the recording. There is so much to learn in it all. Thanks, Margaret Ann. I'm going to open it up now to uh, questions to Margaret Ann or any comments that you want to make on the last talk to Margaret Ann for about 10 minutes, and then we'll have an open discussion. So when you're ready, uh, a hand in the corner or something in the chat so that we can put that to Margaret Ann. I'm glad to give my throat a rest. <laughs> Can I ask I, you I something? Can't... Margaret Ann? <laughs> yes, of course. Put my hands up. Yeah, it's it's me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm behind the screen. Uh, just to find out from you, do you think there is any legitimacy to the claim that um, uh, migration puts pressure on? the fortunes of the those in the lower economic strata. So like working class, immigrants, that that if if immigration is not controlled, that they will lose out financially and economically. Um okay, I mean I I think that's a really good question, Gloria, and it's also a very difficult question to answer. I think um, there's no question of migration not being controlled because since Brexit, um, there's a five point system and you have to qualify at all different levels. The free movement has gone. So it is either you come in under the five point system or you come in as a refugee and um, you know, Britain is a signatory to the 1951 Geneva Convention. It has a duty in international law to accept people um, who come as refugees. Um, now that is a whole nother issue because they'll say gen genuine refugee, not genuine economic migrant. But in terms of migration being controlled, it is being controlled at the moment. What I will say is that people who 
come to the, obviously there is, um, anybody who's had to use the NHS recently knows that, um, that, that there is a strain on the NHS. Now, how one resolves that, or for schools or for um, social services, um, whether migrants directly uh, uh, impact those services, I imagine they do. But and when I say migrants, again, I'm talking about people who come to the country, um, not as refugees. Um, and they do, but they, they also contribute. Now, where it's difficult is if you, in terms of, I just wrote this down, um, in terms of asylum applications, the countries that people, the, where, the places where people come from are um, amongst the countries that people come from are Eritrea, Pakistan, Syria, Iran, Albania, Sudan, Afghanistan, and on and on. So if you have to um, create services for people, you need interpreters, you need um, schools, you know, you, you need things for people. And yes, it, it costs money, but I don't know. I mean, Britain has international obligations to people. How far you go with that? Um, and do you put them on a plane and send them to um, Rwanda? I don't know. That's certainly one way of thinking of dealing with it. I know I haven't answered your question, Gloria, but it is a broad question. It's a difficult one. Thanks, Margaret Ann. There is another question in the chat, Margaret Ann. Okay. Thank you for the great talk. I was very interested in the breakdown of the numbers of immigrants. Biggest group from the new route of Hong Kong. Ukraine, then students, then skilled workers. Can you please clarify for me what percentage of the total are asylum seekers and refugees? Yeah, these are these figures. Thank you for the question. Um, those three groups that I listed are not um, do not include asylum seekers and refugees. And I think um, I'm going to venture a guess, and I have it written down somewhere, but. I'm going to say um, 6%, um, and now that could be wrong, but I have a feeling that 6% of those who come into the country are refugees and asylum seekers. But I can check that. <laughs> can I just say also in terms of refugees and asylum seekers, the way, if, if, if you read the Daily Mail or the Daily Express or any of these papers, you would think every asylum seeker in Europe wants to come to the UK. And um, Britain is fifth in terms of accepting asylum seekers. Germany, France, Sweden, and Italy are ahead of the UK. Um, we get a very distorted view here sometimes of what's actually happening, of the reality. True, very true. Thanks, Margaret Ann. Any mm. other question? Or if anyone wishes to make a comment on what Margaret Ann has said, or from reading uh, your own reading. I make a, just a comment. It's, it's perhaps less about immigration in a way. Um, Margaret Ann, you know, when you were saying that, you know, in terms of like the strain that that one perceives and it is real on the NHS. Um, and of course we know historically the NHS has been carried to a large extent by um, people coming from other places. Um, but there is, there is a school of thought around um, how, why the NHS is under so much strain, there's a kind of school of thought, and I know this isn't really about immigration, but that idea that is almost being left on some levels to kind of, I'm going to use like a strong term, almost being left to rot and decay when, it, you know, so, yeah. that, so that then people go get really kind of fed up with it and, and say, oh my God, I'm just going to go private. Do you know what I mean? Gloria and I had this conversation. We were having this conversation yesterday. And it, almost, it almost feels sort of deliberate in a way, but that's a whole different... I just wanted to put that in there, but but we know that's not strictly immigration. It's 
but they, but you can't think about the NHS without <laughs> kind of thinking about immigration and and you know the people who have come here and really kind of worked so hard. I mean, you you spoke about um, um, Nicole about in Florida what's going to happen this weekend. I mean, imagine if all the immigrants left the NHS for one day. <clears throat> Can you imagine just for one day? Can you what imagine? Would have left? What yeah. would happen? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And can I also say, just in terms of terminology, which we were speaking about before, you know, you never hear um, when someone British goes to the US or goes to Germany or anything that they're referred to as an economic migrant. They're an expat. It's a much more, you know, <laughs> accepting sort of almost like, wow, he's an expat, you know. And, and you know, it's the same thing. But we use yeah. language to, to, to communicate what we want to communicate. In the way we want to. Yeah. Uh, Margaret Ann, there's another question in the oh. in the in the chat, please. Please miscalculation of immigration from the EU countries. I was very interested in the huge miscalculation of immigration from the new EU countries and the possibility, probability that the knock-on effect has been such a negative view of migration in our society. Some people say it was deliberate. I don't know that the Labour government wanted to bring migrants in and um, said, you know, we, we don't expect more than 15, 20,000 a year. Um, I, I don't know if that, was, um, if that was deliberate or not. But yes, it has had a knock-on effect because as the numbers grow, public opinion grows negatively also and um i think that there aren't enough um you know balanced d discussions or debates on migration issues because people it, feel it sometimes very viscerally and you know it and, and aren't prepared to to discuss things rationally um, but yeah, it, it has had an ongoing impact for sure. I see Gloria's hand still up, Gloria. <laughs> I just wanted to please indulge me. I wanted to round up my my comments just quickly. Sure, I think sure. why I raised the issue is um, I was just listening to, I think it's Professor Goodwin, and um, he was talking about the fact that if there is a liberalization of 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 uh, immigration, it enables the government as well as um, organizations to break the contract they have with the local community. For instance, if you think there is not enough people on the, uh, like nurses and doctors, it's like, why are we not training more young people, our young kids that are, look, are youngsters that are looking for jobs? Why are we not training more of them to fill these roles? instead of looking for a more like immediate answer by say bringing in immigration. So it's it's the whole thing about, is, and, and we're, talk, we're not just talking about black and white here because also we can train immigrant, immigrant children as well. We can cha train black children, migrant children as well. So it's not, it's not just, uh, uh, you know, oh, you know, this is about black and white. It's also that the, the contract is also being broken with the black and minorities also now that call the UK their home. But Gloria, I do think there's no danger of, um, the, of as asylum rules or immigration generally rules being liberalized. It's, you know, everybody's fighting to be tougher than the next one. Even <laughs> Keir Starmer is holding back. You know, nobody's saying let's let's liberalize things, let's make things better. It's just a question of how far you want to go in terms of making things tougher. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, Molly has a hand up and also Maggie. So Molly first. Thank you. Thank you. I, uh, this may be uh, an ignorant question, but I once thought I understood or was told that almost always there has been more people 
have been more people leaving the country than coming in. So my first question is, is that true? And if it's changed, is it very recent? Um, great question, Molly. Um, it was, I think, and again, I, I, I'm guessing here, but you're right. Traditionally in the UK, the net um, emigration was higher than the immigration. And it did change and it changed slowly. Now, whether it changed in the late 40s or the 50s, I can't remember, but it's a relatively recent change. Oh, and um, and it has, and as I say, during the, um, the 60s, the 70s, and up to the early 80s, it was, you know, there was, it was a gradual change. There was nothing, um, sort of uh, dramatic about it. That began in the late eighties and the nineties, and it's just gone up and up since. Thank you. Sure. Maggie. Uh, yep. Thank you both very much. The both speakers, they're both fascinating, and uh, like um, Yogi, I'll go back and look at the the the, the stats afterwards. Um, just a couple of reactions, not very um, sort of thought out but um first of all i just think it really is interesting to bring a bit more facts and figures as you as you've done so well to this debate because even the the fact that you know so many of the figures are in for example london was very very high percentage of both you know whatever the, the two divisions that you had percentage of uh immigrants in the society and so on and yet london certainly as represented by um Sadiq khan and and other voices is not really saying we don't need more migration. Um, it, it's the so-called red wall areas and so on, where I should think the figures are, quite, are relatively low. So it's really interesting to bring some facts and figures to the debate to make it clear that it is a very complex debate, but also some of the easy language of riling people up about you know the threat immigration is posing is 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 off the wall. And that kind of then leads me into thinking about the role of Kaj, because I think the bishops must need um, some advice in this area, because um, I know Bishop McAleenan seems to talk quite a bit about it, which is really good. Um, but I just think that we need, we need to develop a humane policy as a society. And it's very important for the Catholic Church particularly as, a, as a, a faith group normally that has a, an awful lot of migration, at least legacy within it, to sort of come up with some thoughts about a humane policy and to communicate that, you know, the potential for this issue really stoking up, you know, right-wing, populist, racist um, energy is is very, very great. Um, uh, and uh, particularly on the racism particular point now the fact that the um, migration is coming from non-EU countries is going to you know grow more and more sort of uh, problematic or it's going to be presented as problematic rather I should say um, so I just sort of think it might be an issue I, as I said I haven't got any great thoughts but I just think that this is an issue on which we would like the Catholic bishops to be speaking out more and more giving information and whatever support we can give to the refugee and asylum groups. Because again, to, to muddle up the refugee and asylum issues with migration, economic migration, they're different. They're totally different issues. Um, well, they're issues, but but they, they play out in the UK debate very, very similarly in terms of, you know, we haven't got enough houses. We have the National Health Services both collapsing and needs them. I mean, I'm active in a social care action group and we argued for the visas, work visas to be extended to social care workers saying, well, we're not paying British born workers enough. <laughs> so if we can get social care workers from elsewhere, please let's get them, even though they're not defined as skilled by the sense of the amount of training they need. And that was agreed. So sorry, it's a very long winded, but just to say, I just think this is, I hadn't really intended to come to this event. Now I've got loads and loads of stuff to go away and worry about. Thank oh, you both thank very much. You. Yeah, thank you. I mean, when we think about, you know, those, um, you know, those kinds of the issues that come up about, you know, 
um, immigrants or migrants taking away housing from the, you know, I always kind of think, but it's, it's always a way to kind of, you know, governments, you know, whether they be Labour, Conservative, they sidestep the issue that they are not doing what they're supposed to be doing a lot of the time, you know, it's they sidestep the issue that a lot of the time, whether it be Labour or Conservative, a lot of the time when it comes to the issue of immigration, there there is a lot of kind of reactive as opposed to long-term responsive um, strategy. I, you know, you see it again and again and again, because, you know, if if next week, you know, vociferous vehement voices started saying oh my god we need more people here we need we need immigrants you will see how quickly politicians will change their tone they will change the talk completely i mean part of why there was that kind of active i mean my uncle ashton who has passed on now came here in 71 as a bus conductor he came to be to be trained as a bus conductor and he said please they came to trinidad and they came with, you know, all of all of the talk that they came with, just as they did, you know, in years before that. And, you know, when you think about it, when you think about how many British people left here to move to Canada, you know, close to a million people moved to Canada, you know, um, English and Irish, close to, well, over two million moved to Australia. And Winston Churchill was worried. He was really worried about the post-war recovery for this country. So I can imagine they kind of thought, oh my God, what can we do? Let's get the, let's get those subjects from our great empire to come over. Do you know what I mean? They will change their tune at the flipper. I just find it very, always very short term and reactive. It's very annoying actually. So <laughs> that's my rant. That's my rant for the Saturday. Not at all, it's not a rant. Uh, Margaret Ann, did you want to add anything to that? I was just going to say, you know, with something that I, I wasn't sure if you would pick up on it, uh, I probably should have picked up on it, um, Nicole, was um, in 1986, um, and it was in my time, but <laughs> it was, um, it's, the government brought in visa restrictions, and it was for, um, for people from India, Pakistan, um, Nigeria and Ghana. Uh, so th they were a they had been able to travel without visas up to that point, and now they brought in visa restrictions, and they did it quite brutally. And um, they did thirty six hours. Um, and in the case of, um, but in all of them, and they were very short, you know, very short periods. Um, they announced it, and um, people were camping um, in the in Terminal Three at Heathrow, um, trying to get in. It was just people coming because they knew they would need visas afterwards. And the way it was covered in the media here, um, the papers were saying, you know, floods of people, and you know, and really, really negative um, sort of coverage about it. And, um, and 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 it and it provoked some public outrage that these people were coming in, um, and it was just like as you say, like you know, we 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 people react to the government reacts to how the people um, to what the people tell them, and I think at this stage people thought, okay, it's getting a little bit too much. We've had it quiet for a while. Um, and the government just all of a sudden brought these visa restrictions in for these four countries randomly. Um, and um, and it was covered really negatively in the press. And the sentiment just got worse and worse towards people coming in because of it. And one thing fuels another and fuels another. And so it goes. Yep. Indeed. <clears throat> okay. Unless there is some burning comment or question from anybody? I can't see anything. Is there anything you wish to say to round up Nicole or Margaret Anne? Good, thank you. Thank you. Nicole? No, no thank you. Thank you all for listening. Uh, Ursula? You're, you're muted, Ursula.
What nice is it to see the refugee with a smile? And I miss so much Brixton and South London. Just <laughs> Thanks. I live nice. in Brixton. <laughs> I know you yeah. live in Brixton still here. <laughs> so nice, so nice, such a nice city. I love mm. it. Well, uh, it, it's uh, uh, sorry, Teresa, you wanted to yeah. say something? Yeah, I would just like to say thank you very much to Nicole and Margaret Ann. It was wonderful, all that study. I yes. came to this country, I'm Irish, and I came in 2006. <laughs> All that I worked in Pakistan and I was watching the situation and I know that a lot of Pakistanis were granted visas to come and work here and I'm watching now and it is uh, really uh, sad to see the uh, way some people who are looking for asylum are treated but at the same time something will have to be settled and it will have to be done in a much better way and everybody's needs seem to and I think housing is one of the first big things that people in this country would need and that would need to be um, looked after by the authorities in the country and um, please God some change will come <laughs> thank you thank you Teresa um, I, I want to say a very very big thank you to all of you I know Saturday mornings are a difficult time uh, for people to give up and to, to come to a webinar I know some people had to leave at 11 uh, but a big, big thank you to everyone for being here. I know that you all who have signed on for this morning would have seen that we have several more webinars coming up. And I hope that you would advertise that to others. It is our 40th anniversary when I say our, uh, it's the 40th anniversary for the Catholic Association for Racial Justice next year, April. And these webinars are supposed to be a, a taster, if you like, to give people an idea as to where we were and where we're going to. So I'd, I'd really encourage everyone to go out and, and to encourage others to join us in these webinars in preparation for the 40th anniversary. And yet again, I can't help but plugging, if you're not yet a member of the association, Gloria would more than welcome you uh, if you would send your name and address, uh, email address to her. And she would keep you up to date with all the information that comes out for Kaj. So anyone wishing or hoping to be a member, please do so if you're not mm -hmm. one yet. And again, you know, the we can only advertise word of mouth. So people will do as others say. So if, if you have friends and you know people who might be interested in racial justice, to spread the word so that they would join us. Other than that, thank you very much for being here this morning. A very, very big thank you to Nicole and to Margaret Ann for all the preparation that was most, most interesting from both of you. And I most certainly will listen to the recording again. It was just for my little brain, it was just too much to take all of it in um, at the same time. So I will listen to it again. Thank you ever so much. And thanks thank again you. to everyone for being here. God bless all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Yogi. Thank you, thank Yogi. You. Gloria, thank you. Richard. Thanks, thank Gloria. You, for thank you, um, your Molly. Thank you. I I to say thank you to Gloria, too. Gloria has set up everything for us. So thank you, Gloria. <laughs> thank you, Yogi Molly. Thank you, Yogi. And you got it very nice, Yogi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Asala. Look after yourself. <laughs>